joy can't compare with the glory up there when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's God singers get home, where never a sorrow or heartache will come, there'll be no place like heaven, my home, when all of God's singers get home. Having overcome sin, hallelujah, amen, will be heard in that land or the foe. Every heart will be light and his face will be bright when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, when never a sorrow or heartaches will come, there'll be no place like hell in my home. When all of God's singers get home. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away, fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. When the shadows of this life have grown, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Like a bird from prison by his bone, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. To a land where joy shall never end. to invite everyone into the auditorium as our worship service is about to begin. Our number is a little bit down tonight, but uh, what an opportunity it is to come and worship God together, sing God's praises and, and uh, encourage one another in songs and hymns and studying His Word. Uh, the uh, eldership would like to share some good news uh, with the congregation is we have met with Kerry Gillis this afternoon. Actually, we've met with him all weekend, 
and uh, he has he has accepted the offer to come and work with the congregation in the Latin American missions uh, as Latin American missions director and our our foreign evangelism minister here at Forest Park, and we're excited about. Uh, him coming and working with us, integrated into the congregation, and sharing the, the gospel opportunities in this country uh, that are available to uh, the Lord's Church uh, you know, through Latin American missions. And we are really excited about what he brings and, uh, and the, uh, his desire to work with this congregation, with this eldership, and in this effort. And so be praying for him in the coming days. He will be coming here, uh, depending on how, how, how the, the dynamics of this move uh, works out, but it's probably gonna be the first or second week, somewhere around that in, in August. So this will be occurring within the next several weeks. And the eldership is really excited about uh, this, this addition uh, to the Lord's work here at Forest Park, and be praying for Him, and uh, and and for for all of us as we work together in in this work. Uh, our first election tonight is uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. It's found on page eight seventy five. Eight seventy five. Please fill out a card if you are uh, 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 texting your uh, attendance tonight, if you're a member. If you're a visitor, please please uh, uh, fill out a card and leave it on the pew and we'll pick that up. if you're using your book. God is love. God is love. Page 180.
at this time, Brother Donnie Swilly will lead us as we all go to God in prayer. Pray with me. Our Father God in heaven, hallowed be thy great and thy glorious name. Father, we come to you in this at this time in prayer, thanking you for loving us. Thanking you for loving a world, a world yet full of sin. In sending your son Jesus from heaven to this earth to live as a man, to be tempted as a man, and yet to live a sinless life and yet die on the cross at Calvary. To purchase the church with his blood, Father, and we thank you. We thank you, Father, that we are members of that body of that body of Christ, the Church of Christ. Father, we pray that as we live here upon this earth, no matter the trials or the temptations that may come our way, that we will know that you are God, that you loved us so much, again, that you sent Jesus into this world to purchase the church with his blood. Father, we pray that we will grow our faith. Father, we pray that we will grow one as one body more in love with you more in love with one another regardless of our background our color or, or financials whatever it may be but that we'll love you supremely that we'll love one another to the point that we strive to make it a part of our lives each and every day of talking just how great our God is how is it our God is love? How it is that, that God loved the world? Father, help us to see opportunities around about us to talk of Jesus, to tell our story, Father, of how is it that your son changed our lives and that as king of our lives, we deny ourselves to strive to glorify you in all that we do, to repent of sin, and to get up, to always strive to do better each and every day because you are worthy. Father, oftentimes, we do not take the opportunity to, to tell of Jesus. We do not do the things that we should do. And we pray, Father, that you'll forgive us we pray, Father, that we will let our light shine before men, and they will know that we are Christians. Father, we, we pray for our brethren at this time, those that, that are sick. We pray for our sister, Allie Garner. Pray for John Crum, Beth Crum. Father, we pray for Deborah Croft, Vernell Howard, Florence James, Beth McLeod, Kitty O'Neill, Rosa Parker, Betty and Barry Robinson, Lewis Wright. Father, we we pray for these, our brethren, and we pray, Father, your, your blessings upon them as they struggle with physical ailments. Father, we pray for, for Brother Paul and Hazel Swanson and the entire family in the passing of, of their nephew. Father, we pray for, for Brother James Dowell and in the passing of his mother. Father, we pray for all those that are mourning loss of loved ones. Father, we pray that, that you can comfort them. They'll look to you for guidance in this most difficult time. But Father, we thank you for, for every blessing that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we, Father, we thank you for this church here at Forest Park. We thank you for the church the world over. Father, we thank you for Latin American missions. And we pray for, the, for, the, for those that are invested in their lives to to help glorify you in the foreign lands. Father, we thank you for our brother, Kerry Gillison, coming our way. Father, we pray that we'll grow together in this work, in love with you, in love with one another, in love for the lost, and striving to tell that great story of Jesus. Father, we pray that as we continue our worship this hour, we pray that it is pleasing unto thee, and it is in spirit and truth. And Father, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our next selection is found on page 231 in your book. 231, Hilltops of Glory. Before the lesson, we'll be singing number 682, To God Be the Glory, 682.
If you will, turn in your books, if you're using your book for the Song of Invitation, number 782. 782. Worthy art thou. Well, it is great to be able to be together with you tonight. And it's really been a great day and a great weekend. So many encouraging things that are going on. And, um, you know, you can look around. You know, we got a lot of people gone. Um, as a preacher, let me just tell you, I hate it, right? I, I mean, it just, I just hate it when everybody, I, but I get it. I took a week here a while back. I understand it. But let me tell you some of the plus side, uh, some of the encouraging side whenever we have these weekends like this where there are just la large groups of people that are not here. It is the privilege of being able to sit back and watch so many people be so intentional about their worship. Of people that are saying, okay, we're going to be in this place and we need to know where, where to worship. And I've tried to find this out to taking communion to, you know, what we got, we got so many people. And I don't think we're going to be able to be with anybody, but, but we still want to spend some time worshiping God. It's about being intentional um, and not about people taking a break even from the Lord. And, and it's just really encouraging to watch. And I, I, w I would give you names if, if, if that were appropriate this evening. But, but I, I, love, I love thinking about that. And I love thinking about how many of our brethren are in so many different places um, all, over, all over the country, even this very weekend. Uh, one, of, one of the places that our young people are is um, we have a group of about 10 that is up in uh, Henderson, Tennessee at Horizons this week. Uh, that's where the other all days are, um, all except for Lainey. They decided to leave her behind. But... Uh, Molly was happy about that, but, uh, but, but they, they took them up there. They left at the crack of dawn this morning and got there just, just, a, uh, just a short time ago. And uh, so we're really grateful. I appreciate your prayers for their continued growth and all those young people that are there. And then um, can't say enough about the excitement for what Don mentioned earlier uh, about Carrie Gillis coming to be with us. Take some time to get to know Carrie. Uh, I'm, I'm just telling you, and some of this is going to happen fast. Pastor, I mean, it's going to happen real fast that he's going to be here. But the potential that is there, I have said for so long that we are on the verge of so many great things. And no pressure, Carrie, but I really believe you're part of God's answer to, to helping to lead and to bring those things out of us that are there. Um, only, com only, you know, down comment I got all weekend about Carrie. Um, is it okay if I share this out loud, Carrie? Somebody said you took 10 minutes of my time tonight, and I didn't. It's okay. Preachers can joke like that. It's okay. Did he just say that? No. But, but I, I'm, 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 I'm going to try to, to understand that. I want us to talk about our ethics tonight. It's been on my mind, and I was thinking, okay, I knew we were going to have a guest speaker, and I didn't know. I knew a lot of people gone. I didn't necessarily want to want to jump back into John because we're on we're on I am the resurrection next Sunday, and I want I want a full house uh, as we talk about the resurrection. But but it's something that's been on my mind for for quite some time now about how we deal with morality and how we deal with with moral convictions. If you haven't noticed, the world that we live in deals with morality in a much different way than it used to. Many of you are very accustomed and were raised in a time where it was not uncommon to hear people take stances on different moral issues. Is that a fair, fair statement for all of us? I mean, even, even for me, right? I'm not as old as some of you guys, but, but I mean, I'm, the gray's coming whether I like it or not. That's, that was normal. But things have changed in our world, and they are changing quickly. We're more and more, and you can almost name your issue. It is not that people are disagreeing with you about your, about your moral stance by taking a different moral stance. But more and more in our culture, what, what we're seeing is that people are saying, those conversations are just not even conversations we want to have a part in. Those conversations become inappropriate. And ultimately... Ultimately, people want to define their morality based upon their situation. Now, I know that's not new. I thought about talk, calling this lesson just Situational Ethics 101. We've talked about that before uh, in more of a, a, probably a more academic setting. But, but, but to understand where you, you, you see this that goes on where someone will take a very simple moral statement. Social media bears these things out uh, in, in, in a great way. Um, 
and, and you, you, can, you, can name, you can name your moral position. I thought about, of about five or six different ones as we were going along through this, but, but the responses are what I want to get at, and social media just shows the things of conversations that, that, that we would have normally. Because what happens in those moments is that people begin to respond with, with lines like this. I hope you never. I hope you never. And then they proceed to tell of some terrible thing that they are saying, at least I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt. They hope you never have to experience this. Now, what is meant by that is if you ever experience these things, then you would realize why that moral position is not a tenable position. I wrote down a few that, 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 that I've heard from people, but I'm just going to tell you, usually when you see these things, there's a lot more emotion. These are very real things, by the way. Nobody's making this stuff up, okay? So we got to, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But, but people, people might say, well, well, I hope that you never have an unfaithful child. Well, well, I hope that you're never in an abusive marriage. Well, I hope that you never get pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, I hope that you never lose your job and struggle to put food on the table. I, I hope that you are never forced to make a decision or a choice that could endanger your life. Familiar with the thought process, right? We've all seen that. And, and typically, whenever those things are brought forth, they are a lot, even though I kind of felt uncomfortable, like kind of tingly even saying those things, right? They're coming from a much even deeper personal place. They're very real. When I hear those things, I, here's what I always want to say. Um, and I don't know if this is the smart aleck in me that comes out. And I, I try to hold it back usually. But I always want to say, me too. I mean, I, I hope I never have any of those things happen to me also. I, I, I don't. I don't want to have an unfaithful child. I don't want to uh, be married to an alcoholic. I, I, I don't want to have to make these choices of life and death. I, I, I don't want to lose my All these things, right? Yeah, man, I, I hope those things never happen too. I hope I never have to experience those things. But that being said, that doesn't change the reality of what is right or what is wrong. My situation and there are some tough situations, doesn't change the reality of what is right and what is wrong. We, we have to be careful that, that we don't allow situations to, to override our conversation. And they can't override our conversation, can't they? Everybody here know how to shut a conversation down? Somebody's saying something you don't like, so you start telling something real personal and powerful and painful about your life. We've all... We've probably been on both sides of that. And it's like, okay, okay. I, I, I mean, I, I hit, I've hit a nerve somewhere, right? Well, sometimes that can distract us from a conversation of what is right and what is wrong. What is holy and what is sinful. People many times want to discuss the situation that surrounds the morality in order to determine the rightfulness of a, of a, of a particular action. And that is a mistake. That is a mistake that leads us to a man-centered religion instead of a God-centered religion. Now, right after I want to say me too, and I hope that those things never happen to me. I think we would be remiss. We would be remiss to not say, you know, God still cares about those situations. It hasn't this been part of what we've seen in the Gospel of John? I think sometimes whenever we can get into talking about morality, we have to be very careful that we do everything within our power to not come across as being uncaring, insensitive, cold souls. We, we bear a burden there. Now, when I said that intentionally, we have to do everything within our power. Paul would say in the book of Romans, as much as depends upon you, you live at peace with all men, right? Right? Well, that means if there's some way that I can I can talk about something and there's a, and there's a way that that someone is going to receive and there's a way that that, that somebody's not going to receive. Choose the way someone's going to receive. Be aware of those things. Right. Just because you have a shotgun doesn't mean you have to use it. Right. About morality. We, we, we have to understand that because God doesn't look at those things. God doesn't even look at sin or morality and say. There it is. Take it or leave it. I don't really care one way or the other. 
That's not what God does. Sometimes people do that. Do they? Do people do, deal with morality? Do sometimes do preachers deal with morality that way? Almost, almost as if they would be happy if you rejected morality. That they would never admit to that, but I'm talking about tone. I'm so I've got some kind of my own judgments upon those things. I'm just saying that's what I don't want to be because God cares. Did, didn't we see this in John chapter 11, especially where, where they were dealing with the death of a loved one? And, and that amazing Bible verse there in John 11, Jesus wept. And we talked about how the psalmist says that, 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 that God collects our tears in a bottle. What's he trying to say? He's trying to say that God cares. God knows. God cares. When John the baptizer found himself imprisoned, forgotten by everyone, and, 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 and he sends this message, are you really the Messiah? Are you really the Christ? Why is he sending it? He's sending it because his world is caving in, and that caused you to question everything when all these things begin to happen. But God knew. And God didn't abandon him, and God still loved him. God cares about each of these terrible situations. I would like for my brethren in the Ukraine to know that God cares for them. You know, I could give some situations in my life, but they all kind of pale in comparison to my house blowing up and my children being, being blown to bits and having to flee to foreign countries. I can't even relate. That's real, right? Hey, I'm not making that up. Those are real people. Those are your real brethren who are dealing with those things. Do you think those things are a test of their faith? Do you think there's a temptation to compromise in whatever way? Well, you know there is. Their situation's incredibly bad. It is in those incredibly difficult situations that we need to know that God is true. And our God is unchanging. And there's that stability there. You see, sometimes when, when we talk about this, I hope it never happens to you, almost the insinuation is, is that you people that are going to take a, a stance of morality, you don't know anything about this. You don't know anything about suffering. You don't know anything about difficulty. Well, let me tell you, I know enough. I don't know everything, but I know enough about the people in this room to say, the people in this room know about suffering and difficult situations. Do you know anything about hard times, hard choices, things that hurt, things that break you, things that put you on your knees, things that you could look at others and say, I hope this thing never happens to you? Of course, of course you do. And it's in those moments where I'm going to tell you what the really hard thing to do is. The really, the really hard thing is not the situation, because guess what? God's going to send the rain on the just and on the unjust. Well, I, you, could, you could be the most godly person and you could be the devil himself and there's going to be difficulty in your life. The greatest sufferer in the history of the world. I think I could dare say the greatest two sufferers in the history of the world. One was the most righteous man in the history of the world. Who am I talking about? That's Jesus, right? Nobody suffers like Jesus on the cross. Right behind him, when I think about great sufferers, I'm feeling pretty comfortable to say he's the most righteous man in the entire world at that moment. That's Job, right? This connection between suffering and righteousness and even righteous suffering. First Peter is where we were this morning. We'll, we'll look at that for just a moment. Uh, but the difficult thing is not the trial. The trial's coming, guys. I wish it wasn't, but it is. The difficult situation is coming. But the really difficult thing is to maintain your faith in the midst of the trial. To not compromise your convictions in spite of a terrible situation when the whole world might look and say, you know, I really can't blame him. Because that's what the world will say. And God would say, no, I will hold you accountable. And you've got, you got the voice of God and you've got the voice of man and they are competing. I'm going to tell you the trial the trial is maintaining your faith. You think about Job, that great sufferer, and in all of this, he did not sin. That's the statement. It's not just that he suffered. It's the fact that in all this, he didn't sin. You, you want to see the statement there, there, there in 1 Peter chapter 2 we looked at this morning? 
The amazing thing is not just that Jesus died on the cross. When he was reviled, he didn't even revile in return. And if you're not challenged by that verse, you don't know what that verse means. But, but, but he was holding to this, there is, a, there is a way that is right. But that is a way that comes from God. And if I'm going to define my ethics based upon my situation, well, I'm going to create a subjective religion. A subjective religion. You, you guys, I remember we had a professor in college, um, and he, he was a subjective grader. Okay? He, would, he didn't have, like, you know, multiple choice. This is the right answer. This is the wrong answer. He would call you in, and he, you'd, just, he'd ask the question, and you would kind of you would give him an answer, and he'd grade you on it. And can I tell you that I loved it? If y'all don't know, I have the gift of gab. Okay? Give me a question. We can talk about this. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll work through this. I mean, it, it, I loved it. I made, I made A's in that class. Um, I, had a, I have a buddy of mine, preacher friend, a very, very smart guy, but, but he, didn't, he didn't have quite the gift of gab or the ability to, to, I call it wit. My dad called it a smart mouth. But he didn't have quite, quite, quite what I have. And he, oh, he hated this guy. He hated him, right? Because he said, because everything is so subjective. How am I supposed to know? And I made an A and he made a C. And uh, it was subjective. Well, I think this, I think that. We, we evaluate different things in life like that. That's dangerous when we start creating a religion based upon that. Because at some point, I'm going to share that religion. I'm going to share it up here, but we're all going to share it as we're evangelistic. Well, well, what gives me the right to, to, to come to you, Teresa, and say, you need to do this? What gives you the right to come to me and say, you, you need to live your life this way? You need to st- uh, do this thing or stop doing that thing? It's, it's a presumptuous statement, right? Only the authority of God. Only the authority of God. When we have a subjective religion... It can be, well, I think this is good. And you can say, so what? I, I, that's, not, that's no religion at all. The, 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 the danger, we, we, we've talked about this before in passages like, like Proverbs, Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. There is a way which seems right to a man. But it is a way, it is a way that leads to death. See, so, so I can be very sincere I can really think this makes sense to me. This makes sense to everybody I know. This makes sense to all of my peers. And God says, where'd you get that from? Where'd you get that from? See, I have to be very careful about putting too much faith in my own gut. Instead, my my focus must be upon the Lord. People have always struggled with this, right? You you look at at uh, things like... Well, people are always talking about love and doing funny things with what love means. But, but let me give you an example. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the church that met there in the city of Corinth. And they had this situation where they were tolerating a, a, a man. They were tolerating a man who had his father's wife, more than likely an incestuous relationship. For those of you in our Leviticus class, he should have gone back to Leviticus as we did this morning. But, but here's the inter- inter- interesting, interesting thing about this. They were proud of it. The church, the Corinth Church of Christ was proud of the fact that in their church, they tolerated incest. Where did that come from? Right? And that's what Paul, Paul's like, I'm not even there. And I'm telling you, that's a problem. I'm not even there. And I'm telling you, in, in, the, in the assembly, take care of it. Right? Well, the problem was their religion was based on what they thought. What seemed right to them? And they created a Frankenstein, if you will. Well, how how do you see your way out of that? I constantly appeal to the word of God. For what is right, for what is wrong. We're called to be holy as, as as he is holy. He becomes the standard and we are directed by his word. That's why Paul tells us that, that, that the purpose of the scriptures, he totally tells Timothy, right? Is to equip us for every good work. It should tell us what we ought to be. There's nothing in the Bible about what color the carpet is, okay? Because who cares? That's inconsequential. But, but when it comes to things that are right and wrong, holy and unholy, sinful or pure, those things have to come from the Word of God. Who are we going to be? How does one become a Christian? How does one worship God? What are we going to stand for? What are we going to say? It better come from the Word of God. Otherwise, it becomes subjective. We, we, ha- we have to 
constantly turn back to the scriptures. It, it, it's it's one of the reasons that. Well, I, I find this rash of not just in the world, but even in churches where people are pulling away from this idea that if you have questions about who we are or what we believe or what we've said or what we've done, that you should come to me and you should expect us to open the word of God. I've heard that all my life, but I'm just going to tell you in recent years, I've had many people say that's not really appropriate. That's not really something they want to think about. And I'm just there. Well, because Carrie took my 10 minutes this morning, I'm not going to get into it. But but it's 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 a big it's a big can of worms to open in our world. You see, sometimes we're called to stand on the will of God. Even when it costs us something. That concept of righteous suffering that we saw there in first Peter, we've preached through first Peter, you you know these things, but so many in our world think that it's like following the path of least resistance and 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 if if standing here is going to cause me problems over there, then I'm not going to stand here. And so they, they wind up not standing where God wants them to stand. Passages like like first Peter chapter four and verse nineteen let those who suffer according to the will of God let them entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. God says, OK, you're looking at me and you're saying, well, I hope you never. And he says, I hope you never too. But if you do. Know that I know. And know that I care and know that I'm with you in the struggle. And you just keep trusting me and you just keep standing with me. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter three. One more verse and we'll be done for for the evening. But I, I want this to kind of stick in your head because because I'm going to tell you there's a fleshly side of every one of us where situational ethics makes sense. OK, every one of us, th 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 there's a part of us that it makes sense to. And that's that's not new. But. But but we're going to be challenging in the word, not not to define ourselves by what we feel or by our experience. But to define who we are by the word of God. I, th I think this is the paramount verse on situational ethics in Romans chapter three. In, in Romans chapter three and verse five, Paul, Paul is writing and he says this it's a few verses. He says, but but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, then what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. He's trying he's trying to explain this idea of how God's grace only shows the greatness of God and how sometimes people twist that. Right. Um, may it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? You see, people are constantly setting up systems of belief that are making it impossible for God to judge. We, we don't like the judgment. We, we don't like the accountability. So that, that, that's not new, right? But that's what he's saying. If that's, if that's what you're saying, then, then it's really kind of messed up because you're taking away the ability even of God to judge. But, but if through my lie, the truth of God abounded to his glory, then why am I still being judged as a sinner? All he's trying to say is that wouldn't make any sense, would it? If, if, if your lie was a good thing, then why would God judge you? Well, point is your lie is not a good thing and why not here's what i want you to get in verse eight why not as we are slanderously reported and as some affirm we say let us do evil that good may come did you catch that there are some people who are putting forth situational ethics they're putting forth this idea i know this is not a good thing but if we do this sinful thing, then maybe some good thing will come from it. Paul says that's slanderous. He says that's slanderous. If that's what you think I'm saying, you don't understand what I'm saying. Their condemnation is just. Whoever's spreading that mess, they're going to whatever they get. That's what they deserve, because that's a lie. May our ethics be defined not by our own self, but may they be defined by God. There are debates about 
the place of immersion in, in the church. And I'm just going to tell you, lots of people have lots of different thoughts about it. And they can tell you stories that will tear your heart up one side and down the other. I promise. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, Jesus still says that he who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He who believeth not shall be condemned. At the end of the day, Peter still says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. So what's it going to be? Is it going to be, well, you have to understand where I come, where I'm coming from and my family background. And, or is it going to be, I just want to be obedient to God. There are many sins in this world that creep into our life. There are some that don't impact you, but there are there are many that do. And in those ones that do, there will always be reasons and rationale. I think every time I ever got in trouble as a child, I tried to explain it. Well, let me, let me tell you what you don't understand, right? Don't don't beat me. But at the end of the day, either it's either it's sinful or it's not. Either it's something we're standing on or it's not. I have to turn to God in order to understand those things. So when I make a, an appeal for people to repent, I'm not asking you. I'm not asking you to repent of something that's just well. That's kind of how I feel about that, Donnie. I'd never wear that shirt. Okay, that's not repentant stuff. That's fashion. But there may be other things that you could say. No, no, no. We got to get right with the Lord. And when we do that, so this is not just about preaching the right things, speaking the right things. It, it is about those things. But we, we, we come to someone who is constant and consistent. And that's where we can find peace. You're not trying to figure out what Wes thinks. Good luck with that, my wife would say probably. Right? We're trying to know what the Lord wills. And it is the Lord's will that you would come and worship him. You come tonight as we stand and as we sing. Be seated, please. As we sing this last song, if you've not had an opportunity, the next song, if, you, if you've not had an opportunity to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper, it's been left prepared in the first room in the first hall on the right, and if you'll leave your pew at this time, you'll be served. <clears throat> Worthy of praise.
Thank you for being with us this evening. Um, we have a, just a ton of announcements and prayer requests, but so if I miss any, I, I apologize. Uh, we do want to continue to remember um, Allie Garner, and she's still in South Georgia Medical Center, but improving. Um, I think her numbers had come down quite a bit even today, Kevin was saying, but um, still has a ways to go. Also, our sister Sharon Huffman, I talked to Natalie this afternoon, and she said that she's also improving, and it's possible she'll be able to come home, and um, I think by home she means Natalie's house, uh, tomorrow. So let's be sure to remember her in our prayers. We announced this morning that the England's grandson, Grant, uh, was able to come home, and so we're grateful for that. Uh, there are many people uh, that are grieving and deaths um, to, that we need to be aware of, um, but especially uh, our brother J.D. and the passing of his mother there in South Carolina, and also uh, Kevin Bradford and the passing of his grandfather, um, neither one of which can be easy things, and, and multiple others that are on your announcement sheet. I hope you're going to plan on sticking around tonight, and uh, we're going to have just an enjoyable time um, out here. Robert's got some fireworks that he says are big ones. Uh, so, um, you know, Bart's not here tonight, so, you know, the police won't be here. We should be good. Uh, we're going to have a good time, cook some hamburgers. I saw hamburgers, there were barbecue, saw some Mexican food back there. Uh, there. There'll be plenty to eat. So if you didn't bring anything, if you didn't bring a lawn chair, I brought extra. Uh, so if you want to stay, you, you can, you're more than welcome to come and, and be a part of that. But we're, it, like I said, they haven't even started to grill yet. So um, it'll, it's going to take a little while. Just enjoy yourself. If you're delicate and can't stand any of the heat, we have air conditioning in the fellowship hall. If you just want to stick around and visit that way, you are more than welcome. But uh, we're looking forward to that. And uh, thanks to everybody that's kind of put that together this evening. Um, if anybody wants to watch the fireworks with uh, Brethren from Church tomorrow night, we are going to be meeting it in the Gan old Gander Mountain parking lot at about 7.30 tomorrow night. Um, several things on the announcement sheet, but let me just say the uh, YAC, uh, Young Adult College Group, will meet at Bill and Glenda Ward's home Tuesday night at 6.30. And also, don't forget about the men's retreat sign-ups. That looks like it's gone actually pretty well. And also, uh, Vacation Bible School is just like two weeks away. Uh, which is kind of cool, all the things going around. But be inviting people. Uh, that's really what makes or breaks a vacation Bible school. And um, we're, we're, we're looking forward to that and many other things over the next few weeks. I'll say it again, Carrie. Uh, excited about you being a part of the Forest Park family. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to that, as many people are. So if there is anything else, if you'll be standing, we'll be dismissed in song and in prayer. Our last selection is found on page 52 in your book, Blessed Be the Name. We'll sing the first and third verse of that song, and then Brother Doug Darty will come and lead us in the closing prayer. please. 
Oh God, we are, we're so thankful for this day that you've given to us, this opportunity that we've had to assemble together and worship. And, and we're just thankful, dear God, for, for the word that you've given us. And we're thankful for your church and we're thankful for all that we have as, as far as spiritual blessings being in Christ Jesus. We hope today that we have we brought praise to you as we've we've sang songs to you and communed with you and and read and studied from your word, that word that you've given us. And we pray, dear God, also that today we've we've edified and encouraged one another and in our walk with you and by being here today for both both lessons, and to hopefully grow our faith and our trust in you and and your Son Jesus. We ask prayers for those that were just mentioned as, as being sick and Sharon Huffman and Allie Garner and Paul Swanson and, and all those that were mentioned and those that have lost loved ones. We, we pray for all of these, dear God, that you will be with them during these, these trying and challenging times. We ask you to be with us as we dismiss. May we be, may we be uh, diligent, that, that we may be convicted, may we be committed to, to growing our faith in you as we leave here and help us, O oh God, to, to make righteous decisions as we step out into this world this week. Help us to get our priorities straight and may we always put you first in all that we do and then may we be mindful of, of who we are and to whom we belong and that this world is not our home. We love you, we adore you, and we thank you for loving us even to the point of giving us your only Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.